In this episode of the Smart Community Podcast, I had a great chat with Jack Barton. Jack is an associate for SGS Economics and Planning and also manager of stakeholder engagement and business development for the Geospatial Research Innovation and Development Lab at the University of New South Wales. He also runs his own private practice, JBDD. Jack and I have a great discussion about how his upbringing in a regional area, his interest in cities, and his love for digital technology have all combined to spark his interest in the smart space. We talk about why smart cities is a good buzzword and the reasons connections and communication are important in smart communities. Jack shares his view on how Australia is embracing smart concepts and why long-term vision is important, especially during this age of experimental pilot programs. We cover smart city standards and what they mean for people working in the space and the importance of digital and spatial literacy and the need for more people to properly understand data so that they can use it effectively. We discuss how open data can facilitate better integration across the disciplines, government and industry and finish our conversation on the emerging trends of boring and somewhat old-fashioned things like protocols, accountability, transparency, governance and longevity. As always, I hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns and smart cities. It's where we live, work and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The smart community podcast what you're looking for. Just before we get into the episode, I wanted to let you know that you can now support the Smart Community Podcast via Patreon. That's patreon.com slash smartcompod with two M's. If you become a patron, you'll get a special episode each month exclusive to supporters. If you would like to feature on the Smart Community Podcast, you can also head to Patreon where you can sponsor an episode. There are options for either a full featured episode or adding a promo for your company or an event coming up. There are both once-off and monthly options. Thank you so much for your support so far. It is my dream for the podcast to be self-sustaining so it can continue to be produced for my smart community no matter what the circumstances. Enough from me, on with the episode. Hello Jack, how are you? Not too bad, so how are you? I am very well. We finally got there with technology. High five to us. Yeah, high five. Let's um, start at the start. And can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you're passionate about? Um, yeah, sure. Um, uh, my background is actually uh, I grew up on a, an agricultural property out in um, northwestern New South Wales. And um, uh, so I guess in, you know, in regional New South Wales and um near the Warrumbungle Mountains, and um, I've just been out to uh, Corinda um, for the David Bowie Festival, and um, he, he was out there in 1983 filming the uh, video clip for Red Shoes, and uh, the, they, they kind of said, you know, why don't we have a festival out here, you know, and that, that was weird, wasn't it, you know, let's have a festival, so went out there um, just recently, and uh, lots of memories came flooding back to the place, you know, so the, the Warrumbungle Mountains were sort of on the, the horizon for where uh, where I grew up and um, I'd always sort of wonder what was over the horizon and when I'd go to school in the city you know you'd sort of drive through more and more increasing urbanization and until you're at the very exciting and beautiful uh, Sydney Harbour you know so um, you know a lot of the time I was I had sort of uh, uh, the uh, the best of both worlds I guess you know and uh, the city always fascinated me as this thing that was just sort of over the horizon and also out in the the bush you know I got a lot of you know I always had a real interest with technology and um, I tried to merge those things and I uh, studied architecture and um, quickly sort of you know took to the the computing side of that and um, ended up uh, doing a PhD um, designing a spatial decision support systems uh, particularly for management of, of public housing communities, high-rise public housing communities. And um, in that, you know, it wasn't just a 
a pragmatic thing about sort of joining asset databases with with tenant databases, but there was a lot more a lot more issues about the actual sensitivities of the the communities that live in these these areas. You know, you know, that's where I was, it really sort of hit me in the face is that you know you really need to have a good sense of ethics and um, not to use technology in a a surreptitious kind of way that might be interpreted as surveillance or spying. It has to be something that's that empowers the communities, that makes places better, and uh, can you know, help people work together um, as a, as a community. Which I think it's it proving to do now that we're you know getting more advanced with it, and we're getting a better better digital literacy across a lot of different communities. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And so yeah, from that I I did a stint down in in Melbourne for about uh, four years, just over four years, working with a group called Oran, the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure network and um, you know I was lucky enough to be working um, nationally with a bit of international stuff and um, flying from you know city to city just um, running workshops and talking to uh, to academics and members of government and industry and um, teaching you know helping people become more spatially literate and um, that was a very exciting time especially when you're looking at sort of you know different disciplines and working with different multiple stakeholders you know the way people can can uh, use data for their own problems you know there's sort of sometimes no two of the same but other times there are very common themes yeah i i think you've answered this already um but what kind of sparked your interest in the smart city space or smart community space yeah well that's yeah definitely one thing led to another and um now it's uh, more important than ever really you know we're it, I'm finding that it's digital technologies are really kind of these pragmatic tools that can help us make uh, make life easier make life better and importantly also can look at the the you know more uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, areas um, uh, of uh, cities and communities and be able to address that, at least sort of make it a bit more uh, uh, visible and rally um, some uh, energy around uh, helping solve those what we call wicked problems. We've got many people with, you know, different sort of motivations and uh, um, uh, no clear sort of stopping point, you know, so there's always this element of negotiation and ongoing kind of work that needs to uh, revolve around something and that's where spatial coordinates come in. You know, they're this one constant where, you've, you know, you've always got this sense of place and space that you can um, hinge a discussion around. Mm. So tell me what a smart city or a smart community means to you. Good question. Um, I understand you've done over 70 interviews um, so far. And, um, you know, when I've been listening to some of the, the previous um, podcasts, you know, there's certain elements that are consistent, you know, where people have sort of uh, had similar things about, oh, yeah, being, you know, digitally enabled or human centric or whatever, you know. Uh, but then also, I mean, I guess there's been, everyone's got their own sort of flavor to that um, as, as to what the smart city means to them is what they do. Um, to me, I mean, it, it is, you know, people can say, oh, it's a buzzword, but it is a very good buzzword, you know, as soon as you say smart city, you Immediately, you know, people can understand we're going to be using technologies, but that's not the answer to everything. Um, and uh, there's a strong element of um, communication and, you know, to go back to things that are, you know, everything but technology, I guess, you know, better uh, um, communities, you know, more green spaces, less car dependence, you know, whatever else. I guess the we've been doing a bit of work with um, emergency services and um, one word you, they, there they use a lot, which I like, is situational awareness. So I think, you know, not only, um, you know, sort of being a, uh, a narcissistic smart city that just gazes inwardly, but um, one that can actually be aware of, you know, its neighbours and uh, its place in the world. Um, uh, and that's, I think we've got a, a really... Uh, unique opportunity to do that at this point of time where we've got uh, such good communication tools that are being applied for our our built environments. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that this concept is so important? Once again, it's about you know connection and and, um, communication. Um, It's when we're dealing with wicked problems that that we face like you know traffic congestion or um, uh, you know environmental degradation or whatever else um, there's, it's, we need to work hard and communicate hard to, um, to reach a, an optimal consensus. You know, it's not like there's right answers or wrong answers in the, in between all these different stakeholders. So consensus building, I think, is, is a, a, an ongoing thing that humans, when they're living on a finite amount of resources, are always going to be having to, uh, to, to manage, you know. And that's where um, also I think it's very important to have evidence-based um, kind of approaches to things where we're, you know, where we're sharing the data, objective data, 
and that's you know, scientifically sort of uh, rigorous and then um, using that to base the discussions on you know that's where I think the smart city concept is important this, the city is um, and, and uh, the built environment is a kind of an objective thing that's out there that exists and people can interpret it in different ways it's just important to uh, to share what we think about those things to uh, try to manage them in the best possible way mm. Yeah, cool. I, I I like that approach. I think that we need to. Um, I think the question you answered before this one, um, talking about uh, you know, communicating with our neighbours. So that kind of regional approach, and I think that's really important that we um, look at you know the built environment in that way. That it's not just a one city. Um, we're going to do this kind of thing because at, at the end of the day, yep. people want to move between cities and communicate between cities and learn from each other. So I think that's yep, really important. Yep, yep. Benchmarking and, um, you know, being able to sort of see where you are in five years as to if you've achieved your aims or not as a, as a community, as a city. And as you mm-hmm. say too, I mean, there's there's been a lot of places, I shouldn't mention names, but there's been a lot of places internationally where, you know, they have had uh, the idea of a smart city as being one where it's like, okay, this is the information city and there's just this one singular purpose. Well, you know, or, you know, mm-hmm. they have been framed like that you know a, a, a Mazda in in uh, uh in the emirates um you know that you know the tech the, the sustainable city you know i mean that really sort of just had this concept and wasn't didn't quite have the things that made a working city it didn't have the the diversity and the, the density and the the, the the wicked problems that sometimes you know in it sort of invigorate a, a city you know and, and there's been a lot of other examples like that where you might just have a you know a um just one single kind of brand on a, on a, a place, you know, uh, that's just you know, often created very rapidly. Um, I think that sort of thing. Although there might be buildings and a few people living in there, they're not. I think they've they've given us a good example of what not to do. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, I agree. I think um, that places that we live, so towns and cities and um, communities, are built not by putting a bunch of buildings together or whatever, but by people right so people congregate and that's how the city is or the town or region or whatever is is created so i think if you you need people to be smart right (laughs) absolutely i mean that's the big sort of aha moment that um a lot of architectural students have you know is that it's you know it's not about the actual bricks and mortar it's about the space in between them and and how to facilitate human habitation on the planet really you know Mm -hmm. okay how do you think australia or we can go down to New South Wales uh, is embracing the smart concept? Um, well, yeah, I mean, certainly it, it, it goes right up to with the, um, the federal government's um, uh, cities agenda and, and uh, with the smart cities and suburbs way of allocating, you know, funding to different uh, local governments and partners. Um, I think that has been very successful so far. It's, it's you know, it, it's permeated uh, a lot of um, uh, different uh, cities and regions and engaged with um, SMEs quite well, I think, all the startup culture and, and what all the different technology providers and things. I think it's it's mobilised the the population pretty well. Um, what I am keen to see is how this sort of plays out in the longer term. Um, if we can really build on these things or what might be just the, uh, you know, for, I mean, experimentation is great, um, but you know, I've seen a, seen a few sort of <laughs> initiatives come and go, you know, in my time. I think it does need to be um, designed with a more long-term view and uh, certainly, you know, not so much tied to funding cycles, but, you know, ideally we want to be looking at a 10, 100 year kind of um, window into the future, uh, especially with the uh, the challenges that we're facing right now in terms of um, you know, managing populations and um, global warming and uh, the technological curse of the past being the motor car, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we've got a, a very exciting future actually. And I think uh, technology is the thing that can uh, give us a, a good smart future in light of these challenges. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, we're doing a lot of short-term um, things with smart smart cities or smart technology. And I think it's important to pilot and test these things, but without a long-term you know, goal or um, objective or vision, it's never going to work because the, you know, the, when the, the grant dries up or the you know, the funding stream drives up. You actually need ways to continue these. Um, and and I think that they're, they're sus- and you need to make them sustainable, I suppose, in, in all the senses of, you know, the word, not just environmentally, but economically you, you, as well. Yes, you need to be able to prove and measure how sustainable they are, you know, show the evidence, you know. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and and now this is sustainable, but you know, for if it only lasts three years, it didn't sustain, did it? You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think um, 
that type of thinking needs to be thought about at the forefront. Like, okay, one, you know, once we've proved this technology, where's the funding going to come from initially? And then how much are we going to save? And then where's that going to go? And where's that going to feed into? I think that that's really important. And maybe that's a, something that's not um, happening. I, I think it's happening definitely in certain areas and pockets and that kind of thing, but maybe on a yeah. national scale. Yeah, well, I mean, also, we, it's um, the international standards, ISO, the International Standards Organization has is aware of this, you know, and there yeah. are some, you know, there are some good standards in place now for, you know, how we can design our, our cities to be more um, sustainable and, and to measure that sustainability, what we need to have in place um, to do that. You know, there's there's um, quality of life indicators, ISO 37120. Um, then there's also um, ISO 37106, um, which is um, the guidance on establishing smart city operating models for sustainable communities. And they're very good documents. I mean, it sounds boring. <laughs> and and they, indeed, they do talk about a lot of the boring stuff that often gets uh, gets missed. But, um, you know, we have got the structure there as set out by the um, ISO. And that will be interesting because that means that once you get down to the different um, different countries, different cities and different areas that are harmonising with these guidelines, you know, I think you've got a very good example of standardisation, you know, and, and that's that sort of standardisation that allows you the freedom but with certain harmonisations is, is what made, you know, the electricity grid be able to evolve or what made, you know, um, um, our, our transit systems able to be developed, you know. I mean, that is, that is you know, looking into history, I mean, we, we do need these, um, these fundamental kind of um, foundations in place and we have got them so that's you know can't be underestimated you know that, that that's the thing that'll make it work without that and what we have seen in the last few years is where you've just got different groups different interests sort of doing their own you know experiments and calling it a, a smart sustainable city but you know when you scratch the surface i mean what's the longer term what's the big vision you know mm -hmm. and i think um some people working in the space probably don't even know that there are smart city standards um yes. and <laughs> yeah and then like let alone how to use them and what they mean for you know local governments and other people working you know other businesses in the space so i think it's a really important topic and um i think a lot of people don't think this is real um particularly you know maybe engineers and um people that are you know worked in the space for so not the not smart city space but you know the built environment space for so long but I guess it becomes very real when you've got standards and things that you can point to and say, oh, this is, you know, this is... Well, that's it, you know. Yeah. And that's why I said it was a, a buzz, smart cities is a buzzword, but it's a good buzzword, you know. It can corral yeah. people and align people and, um, you know, convey a, a it's like a, a you know the Richard Dawkins's idea of a meme you know it is this this um little kind of small package that can relay a, a lot of information and um although yes I guess in the last few years you know we might even be getting a kind of a buzzword fatigue you know and uh it'd be easy for people to sort of dismiss oh yeah smart cities isn't that just some kind of thing that these geezers are trying to you know <laughs> make money with or whatever you know but when you look into it it is a very um it's a it's a damn serious thing you know because if uh, the alternative is dumb cities <laughs> that'll mm -hmm. be not good you know? <laughs> yeah that's 100 percent right okay what are some of the projects and things that you're working on right now um i've actually um i've got uh, wearing two hats uh, right now um i'm an associate at uh, sgs economics and planning and they're an excellent team there i'm working with them um uh, to uh, develop their uh, digital strategy and uh, to, um, to plan the next few uh, steps into the future there. And um, I'm also um, uh, uh, managing uh, stakeholder engagement and business development for uh, the Geospatial Research Innovation uh, and Development um, Lab at uh, the University of New South Wales. Um, that's uh, with, uh, once again, an excellent team uh, led by Professor Sissi Zlatanova. And um, we're uh, just sort of emerging now. We're in the first six months of existence and we're um, scoping out a few different projects and we've already uh, got a few under our belt. We've been um, working with Fire and Rescue and uh, a few of the other different um different groups doing some laser scanning and um, starting to um, look at rapid data acquisition and how that might be used in uh, uh, emergency um, events or um, be that evidence-based for base for the uh, spatial environment, you know, and so we're uh, planning a few different, you know, collaborations around that, what we can do once we've um, scanned and digitised uh, the cities, how then you can add value to that, that raw data. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I have someone I'll have 
have to introduce you to. Oh, good. We can help out with that. Or, yeah, let's, yes, let's no, no, we, yeah, 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 no, this is the time where we're keen to be meeting people and shaking hands and, you know, letting us, letting people know that we're here to, <laughs> and happy to, to uh, do a few, uh, do a few projects and uh, introduce our team. Um, a, a lot of our, actually, I think all the team, I'm the only local person here, all our team are from overseas. So it's um, been good introducing them to the Australian environment and um, mm. they bring a wealth of knowledge from uh, TU Delft primarily. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Netherlands, you know, they do, they do things really well over there, I think, you know. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm heading over there uh, next year to look at smart mobility. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah. Yeah, I just got a Churchill Fellowship, so... Um, oh, congratulations. Okay. Very good. Uh, yeah, so I'll be heading to the Netherlands um, amongst, I think I've got eight countries on my list. Yeah, that should be really good. <laughs> that'll be very memorable. That's very good, yeah. Okay, that's enough about me. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think we can better integrate across the different disciplines, government, academia, and industries? Yeah, well, multiple stakeholders of the, the city. And, and that was the, um, that's the thing. I think, you know, um, good standards, like we mentioned before, I mean, they're, they're the, the base. And that, uh, well, one thing I'll point you to is um, um, the semantic stack by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, the, the inventor of the internet, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And um, it's a bit similar to um, my other favourite little hierarchy, that sort of pyramid of data, information and knowledge. You know, you, you, with the semantic stack, you've got this kind of idea that, you know, that the data and the, the, the protocols and the standards are the foundation. And then you, you, you can build on top of them to to enhance the, the information levels and work at that, that knowledge level and, and um, higher sort of human activities. Um, and so... I think we really need to, you know, have good foundations of, of data so that we're all sort of talking with the same protocols, but not to have that as this thing that just forces people into a particular rut. You know, you need to allow for um, for accessibility and, and, and diversity and, um, you know, sort of just common common concepts and um, openness, of course. You know, there's been a great open data movement and that's really, you know, measurably um, helped with research and development and all sorts of things. Um, in fact, in the, the Productivity Commission identified that if a whole lot of um, cancer researchers had been able to get to access the de-identified data earlier, they could have saved several lives by finding a correlation with CAT scans and mm-hmm. cancers, you know. And so, I mean, it is the sort of thing that that does save lives, you know. I mean, we need to have these these um, uh, systems in place for when there are, are inevitable um, emergencies season and disasters and things so I think there's a good driving uh, motivation for that beyond the, the dollar value of these these initiatives you know so yeah how can we uh, better integrate across disciplines um, showing good examples helping um, increase spatial literacy too I think you know that's you can't do it enough you know just show people what you know mesh blocks are and how the ABS works and, and how you can read and write data I guess there's still a, a, a fear of opening up data for fear of what might happen you know what, what you might expose yourself to well that's kind of a bit of a myth you know like it's as soon as you can sort of just de-identify the data and get it in a good you know looking good you know it opens up a lot of opportunities um, that wouldn't have been there before and haven't been there historically because we've just sort of been hoarding data as silos whether we uh, planned it or not you know so we're breaking silos apart definitely there's a lot of initiatives out there that are doing that and it's um having measurable um improvements on on operations you know Mm, and i think um you're right data in a silo might not be really useful but once you can correlate it um you know in that cancer example then you know you can save lives i mean maybe not as drastic as that every time but like the information you can get and i think you're right the privacy thing needs to come into it we we know that 100 percent, but it doesn't mean that it just completely shuts everything down i think that's it it seems some people are really feeling black and white about it which i think it's so it's actually very gray and the only way you move through gray is to exactly what you said which is um that digital or um spatial literacy and just increasing it some of these concepts are not rocket science <laughs> they're just um you just people just need to know about them and and be able to access information and, and educate themselves in a really quite simple way yes um and and when you're talking about like um gray between uh, the black and white i mean perhaps it's a uh, it's a spectrum you know as kate crawford from from uh, mit and other other groups mentions you know it's not this binary kind of thing it's not sort of like public or private you know you've got this kind of this whole sort of uh, range of things it's a bit like I mean, taking it back to to the built environment, you know, it's not like 
you've, you've either got 100% public space or 100% private space. In fact, you know, you can define privacy as your ability to control your level of publicity. And so we've got to be aware that, and, and you know, this is another thing that will require a lot of kind of consensus and, and you know, there are standards out there, but in the way that we can um, keep what has to be secure, secure, um, because that is what that's once again sort of an issue that can have lives at stake. But, but then also being able to um, access the data rapidly and in an authorised way is another thing that we're we're looking at at the Grid Lab is you know something where you can um, when you're using have got, you've got multiple stakeholders and uh, important sort of things that could go wrong. You know it, it's uh, sometimes you don't want the data to be the thing that's the the weakest link. You know, mm. and I think what you said before about the standards that. Yes, let's have standards, but they need to be agile or, or adaptable based on people's situations. Yep. Uh, and I and I think it's good to have that base, but then you need that level of literacy to be able to make good decisions about you know whether those things change or shift a little bit or pivot. Absolutely, yes, that's that. Yeah, it's very true. What are the emerging trends that people aren't talking about enough, in your opinion? <laughs> yeah, enough is probably the important word at the end. Of it. Yeah, no, it's a tricky question. I don't know that people aren't talking about them, so I don't know. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, what the emerging trends that people aren't talking about enough? Well, like I flagged before, I guess the boring stuff because it's boring, mm. but it can, with mm. a bit of work, you can make it exciting. Um, you know, just things like, you know, protocols and, you know, look, looking at really getting into the security side of things and the, the privacy side of things and whatever else, you know. Um, look, I mean, there, there are such a good lot of people out there sort of working and writing on this this uh, uh, stuff. I mean, it's hard to sort of pick something. I mean, you've, you've, you, all these issues about inequality, you know, that's a very important thing. Um, you know, authors like um, Anthony Townsend and Ellen Broad and Kate Crawford, you know, they, they deal with all these sort of data ethics things, you know, very elegantly. And, uh, you know, this is sort of something that, you know, is really critical for, you know, there's a lot of things if we ignore data ethics, you know, it could go very wrong. So um, I think, you know, as important as it is, I mean, maybe maybe it's not being talked about enough. I think, you know, there's um, more people that know about that and practice good ethical, you know, data management, the better, you know, and the, and the more equipped you are to deal with it when you're exposed to potentially being a victim of unethical data practices, you can start to see where things might have gone wrong, you know, if, if people are releasing private identifiers or spatial identifiers or anything else like that, you know. And uh, yeah, so what, what else aren't people talking about enough? Um, look, I think we are seeing problems where we've got now got the sort of proven evidence uh, of vendor lock-in um, and what might happen, you know, mm. if a, a group might change, you know, move from a closed proprietary product to more of an open one. Um, there are a lot of teething problems with that. And um, so we do need to, and I think the vendors are slowly catching up. They're realising that people are using and want and, and they can play in the open space, you know. They, they might have closed you know, proprietary software, but as long as they're sort of um, inputting and outputting good open OGC formats or whatever else, you know, you've got a capacity there for using their product in a constructive, integrated way, you know. I, don't, I think it's we've seen that there's, you know, just wanting to lock people into one silo has been a bad thing. And, um, you know, yeah. may, maybe also something like the old-fashioned kind of things that we aren't talking about enough, just getting back to, you know, accountability, transparency, governance, you know, um, mm. those sort of things, uh, uh, you know, longevity, you know. Uh, maybe you could put them in the boring basket, but, you know, they, these are the sort of things that we need now more than ever, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. I enjoy the boring stuff as well. Um <laughs> My favourite thing is, you know, talking about signage um, and the future of signage. Wow. Uh, and it really interests me about that people don't look at signs, whereas I look at every single sign and find it fascinating. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, but also government processes as well, and that incorporates so many things um, that I think if we can even improve one government process slightly, um, then, you know, it can really change the way that people can interact in a city or a town yep. and, you know, the amount of money we could save so then it can be spent on the community. Uh, it comes into you know, all those things you said as well, the boring stuff that that flows down into these um, systems and, and I think somebody needs to be thinking about the boring stuff so then we can look at all the cool, shiny, fun stuff because that's everyone wants to be in that space but if you don't sort out the boring things first then we can never, we can only, you know, 
step one step forward and then 10 back and then keep going like that whereas I think yeah if you get your ducks in a row and you know it'll change that's the other thing too you need to be I'm using your word a lot that you know that that literacy is so important because then you can actually make decisions when things go wrong like you said whereas if you don't know what's happening something goes wrong then you're likely and you know you're likely to just say okay well that didn't work let's never do anything like that again yeah. and that's a real shame yeah. you know and never never before mm. have we had this sort of amazing cumulative digitized knowledge bank as a species you know so it really is in our hands to do something with it some um, uh, you know a good way to take us into the future you know and there's a lot of work in that for many people i guess that's the point you know it's many stakeholders definitely and i mean it's one of the reasons that um you know you said like we've got this kind of community of of, of digital um I don't know what the word would be. We've just got this hub of people that are so willing to help because to increase that level of education that um, yeah. using literacy again. Yeah. But um, yeah, and, and it's never, I don't think we've ever had that before because we can so, we can connect now so easily. Uh, and I mean, that's why I started the podcast really because I wanted to make it accessible for everyone like the community can listen um as well as you know government agencies can listen everyone can get something out of it yep. and then also connect with the people um that have come on there because i i have the amount of conversation i have that people are just keen to collaborate you know and because i feel like we do if you do good work then um uh, you know you'll have the next job and the next job and the next job coming yes up. um and that's that's also been one of the the things where i've personally found a real benefit of using open source software like um for um my favorite geographic information system is, is qgis and um i've run a few workshop i've run many workshops internationally and and uh, a few internationally with that and one time I, I had a great time over it uh, as a guest at the far eastern university in manila and uh, i was expecting it to be really difficult to you know set up a, the lab or whatever but you know open source you know, you just download it, put it in there. You're doing it all completely by the, the terms and conditions. And then you can be in a completely different country and, and um, all be on the same page, you know, within minutes. And then you can start to look at the, you know, the humanitarian open street map stuff or, or whatever else and teach people about how to use GIS. And, and then while, while they're actually um, solving problems, you know, particularly you might be able to sort of identify a... Uh, a disaster area and then start to build up, show where the road networks are and, and you're up and running. You know? So, I mean, the, the metabolism of these things is really quite impressive. You know, I'm interested to see where, what, what it'll be like in uh, the next 10 or 100 years, you know. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, me too. Oh, it's been so great to talk to you today, Jack. Thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. Cheers, eh? I just have one last question, which is how can people connect with you? Oh, well, um, uh, my Twitter handle is jbdd. That's Juliet Bravo Delta Delta. And um, on uh, LinkedIn, uh, I'm Jack Barton Digital. And um, I Google pretty well, I think. Um, I've got a web page. It's just sort of like an online brochure, but um, a, a goofy kind of thing left over from 20 years ago, <laughs> which I irregularly update. And that's um, uh, jbdd.com. Um, but it's only for the hardcore. You know. <laughs> I need people that are interested in boring stuff. <laughs> Oh, I'll have to go have a look now. (laughs) Well, thanks, Jack. I'll put all the links um, in the show notes and uh, people will be able to click away and connect with you. Um, I really look forward to meeting you in person someday. Uh, I think we'll have lots to chat about. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Jack. Thank you very much. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website mysmart.community. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community or find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter at smartcompod. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears, so thank you in advance. As always, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.